Good evening. In a way, this is rather a special program, because it is our 500th Sky at Night. And I just wonder how many people remember this picture, the very first one we ever showed in April 1957. This is the Aran-Roland Comet with the famous forward spike, which is not, in fact, a false tail at all, but merely material spread about in the plane of the comet. And this was me in the same year. Times change. Well, I'm afraid we're not going to see that comet again. It's been thrown out of the solar system and is now wandering thousands and millions of miles away between the stars. And I shall always remember it with very great affection. Well, back to the present. The Hubble Space Telescope is continuing to send back superb results. Look at these pictures of Saturn's major satellite, Titan, the first time details being seen there. And I can hardly wait until the year 2004, when the Huygens probe is scheduled to come down there and tell us once and for all whether Titan's surface is all land or a chemical ocean or a mixture of both. And here's another lovely Hubble picture, the Cat Eye Nebula. And no telescope at ground level can show in detail anything like that. So the telescope really is a triumphant success. But you know, for this 500th program, I thought we'd do what we sometimes do and have a general look round the sky and try to tell you what's on view at the present moment. And one thing that is on view is the red planet Mars, high up in the south after sunset, uh, brighter than any star. But I'm not going to say much about it now. Here, in fact, is a drawing I made a few nights ago with my 15-inch reflector. And you can still see there the northern polar ice cap and the V-shaped dark marking known as the Sirtis Major. But I won't go into it now because we did discuss it in detail last month. Of the other planets, uh, Venus now rises a bit before the sun, and there's another recent drawing of it. But, of course, you can never see much on Venus. All you're seeing is the top part of a layer of cloud. But Jupiter is now coming into view at a fairly reasonable hour. And there's my recent drawing of it, again with a 15-inch reflector, showing the gaseous disk and the cloud belts. But Jupiter, I'm afraid, is very low in the sky, in the southern hemisphere, below declination minus 20 degrees. It's not far away from the bright star Antares in the Scorpion. And Antares really is a lovely star, and the Scorpion, Scorpius, is a glorious constellation. But it's always low down from here, and very sadly, we don't in fact see all of it, because our horizon comes and cuts off the bottom part. And that's a tremendous pity, because when you see Scorpius overhead, as you can from the southern hemisphere, it really is a marvellous constellation. But Jupiter is near there now, far brighter than any star, and in the constellation of Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. Now, Jupiter is far brighter than Antares. A star and planet magnitudes work in rather the way of a golfer's handicap, with the more brilliant performers having the lower values. Thus, Antares, magnitude one, is brighter than the pole star, magnitude two, you can go down to magnitude six before you need optical aid. But Jupiter is brighter than that, brighter than zero magnitude, in fact, minus two and a half, and no star is as bright as that, so you can't mistake Jupiter, brighter than any other planet with the exception of Venus. At the moment, though, it's in Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, and um, I can imagine people saying, what's all this? We know about the 12 constellations of the zodiac, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and so on, but Ophiuchus is not one. So what is Jupiter doing in Ophiuchus? And there seems to have been some curious confusion recently about the signs and constellations of the zodiac. So if I may, I'll try and clear it up. First of all, can we consider the ecliptic? And this is defined as the projection of the Earth's orbit onto the celestial sphere. And you've also defined it as the apparent yearly path of the sun among the stars. And of course, it goes around the sky once every year. Now, because the planets move on almost the same plane, they keep close to the ecliptic. They go around the sun in circles, but their planes are very much the same, apart from Pluto's, and therefore, if you draw a plan of the solar system on a flat piece of paper, you're not very far wrong. And, of course, the ecliptic traces the 12 famous zodiacal constellations, uh, beginning in Pisces in March, where the sun is now, and then Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and so on. But between Scorpius, the scorpion, and the next one, Sagittarius, the archer, it goes through part of another constellation, Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, which sprawls down and crosses both the celestial equator and the ecliptic. So although Ophiuchus is not ranked as a zodiacal constellation, it does enter the zodiac and planets can pass through it, as is happening now. In mythology, Ophiuchus represented Aesculapius, the great doctor, whose skill was so great he could even restore the dead to life. And finally, the king of the gods actually struck him down with a thunderbolt in order to prevent the underworld from being depopulated. But in the sky, 
of futures is not very distinctive. The one or two brightest stars, but no really proper shape. All the same, let's have a look at the picture taken by Douglas Arnold. There are plenty of stars there. And uh, if, in fact, we dim it down a bit, we can merely see the brighter stars. And that makes a better idea of the shape. But remember, a constellation has no real meaning at all. Because the stars in any constellation are at very different distances from us and are not really associated with each other. Look, for example, at two of the stars in Ophiuchus, Zeta and Eta. Well, they look fairly close together, but they're not. Zeta is a very luminous star, hundreds of light years away, and Eta is much closer, only just over 100 light years. So they are not really associated at all. We are dealing with nothing more significant than line of sight effects. And if we go toward that part of the sky, we very soon lose the shape of our futures altogether. In other words, a constellation means absolutely nothing at all, and we can make what constellations we like. If we use the Chinese patterns, we wouldn't have a great bear or a round at all. We'd have a cat and a hippopotamus instead. And our star maps would look quite different, even though the stars themselves would be exactly the same. So the constellations are man-made and purely arbitrary and quite meaningless. And the only people who are worried about them are, of course, the astrologers, and astrology is such utter rubbish in any case. Moreover, very few of the constellations bear any resemblance to the objects after which we name them. But one that does is the magnificent Scorpion. Scorpius, with a long line of stars, really can conjure up the impression, I suppose, of some kind of crawling insect. And the leader is the red Antares, a lovely red supergiant star, the rival of Mars. And to either side of Antares is a fainter star. And both those faint stars are, in fact, very luminous. They're also a long way away. But if you have binoculars, look close to Antares, and there you will see a little fuzzy patch. And that is the cluster M4, Messier 4 the fourth object in the famous catalogue drawn up by Charles Messier in 1781. And it's made up of a whole assemblage of stars, and it really is rather a lovely sight. There are many of these open clusters, but M4 is a good one, and it's only just below naked eye visibility. But all these things I've been talking about are early morning objects, and not everybody likes sitting up before sunrise. So let's come back now to the evening sky, and turn, as we so often do, to our old friend Ursa Major, the Great Bear, with its seven famous plough stars, most of which are around the second magnitude. And look, please, at the second star in the bear's tail. That is Mizar, and close beside it is a much fainter star, Alcor. And that's the best example of a naked eye double star. But use a telescope, and you'll see that Mizar itself is double. There it is to the upper right. Two stars so close together that to the naked eye they appear as one, with Alcor down to the lower left, and in between, a totally disconnected star in the background. And the two Mizars are, in effect, members of a binary system. They really are associated with each other. And seen from close range, I suppose they might look something like that. But of course, they're a long way away from us, and a long way away from each other also. Also, from the Great Bear, we can find the Pole Star. Consider the two pointers, Merak and Dupe. With binoculars, you'll see that Merak is white, and Diope is decided orange, so Diope has a cooler, a cooler surface. And they show the way to Polaris, the pole star, which lies very nearly at the north pole of the sky. Not quite, I may say. It's about one degree away. And there's a very easy way to show that, and you can take them spectacular pictures. Simply merely take a fairly fast film, aim your camera at the pole star on a clear night, and give a time exposure, 30, 40 minutes, even longer if you like, and you will get star trails as the stars are carried down by the Earth's rotation. But look right in the middle there, and you will see the very short curved trail which marks Polaris. And if Polaris were exactly at the pole, it would appear as a point. Uh, I may say that there's no equivalent in the Southern Hemisphere. Go south, as I did a little while ago, and take a photograph of stars near the South Pole, and there's no bright star there. The South Pole is just off the top right of this picture, but there's no equivalent. And in fact, the south polar star is a very obscure one called Sigma Octantis, which is none too easy to see with the naked eye, even on a clear night. Of course, Polaris in the Northern Hemisphere is not really important in itself. It merely happens to lie in the direction of the Earth's axis pointing northward. And it hasn't always done so. In ancient times, when the pyramids were built, the pole star was not Polaris at all, but a fainter star, Theuban, in the constellation of the dragon, more or less between Mizar and Cockab, the second star of the Little Bear. And Thuma now is below magnitude three. So the pole has shifted. And why is that? Well, the answer is called what we call precession. It's due to the fact that the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It bulges out very slightly at the equator. 
and the sun and the moon pull on their spirals and make the earth wobble very slightly as it spins. Not quickly, but perceptibly, in rather the way of a gyroscope that's running down. You can see here with this gyroscope, it's starting to topple, and it's precessing. The top is waving around. Now, the Earth does exactly the same thing, but not so quickly. The gyroscope is going round in a few seconds. The Earth takes 26,000 years to complete one turn like that. So in 12,000 years from now, the pole would have wandered away from Polaris and have got to the brilliant blue star Vega in the constellation of Lyra, the Lyra, and there's a Ron Arbor photograph, which I'm afraid you're not going to see well at the moment. It's rather too low in the north. And then the pole will very slowly return, pass by Thuban, and in 26,000 years, come back to its present site near Polaris. So the shift is slight, but it is there. Now, another brilliant star, visible in the evening now, is Arcturus, in the constellation of Boethes, the herdsman, and easy to find, simply follow around the tail of the great bear, and there you'll come to Arcturus, even brighter than Vega, with a magnitude just above zero, and a lovely light orange colour. And Arcturus is big, diameter more than 20 million miles, and very much bigger than our sun, whose diameter is less than one million miles. And yet Arcturus only weighs about four times as much as the sun. Well, generally speaking, giant stars, such as Arcturus, are rarefied, and much smaller stars are more condensed. It's rather like weighing a lead pellet against a meringue. So Arcturus is large, but rather blown out. And the distance is 36 light years, one light year being nearly six million million miles. Now, astronomically, that is not far. The constellation patterns seem to stay almost unchanged for year after year, century after century, because the stars are so far away. They are not really fixed in space. They are moving around in all kinds of directions at all kinds of speeds, but they are so far away from us that their individual or proper motions are very slight. But Arcturus, one of the very nearest of the bright stars, does have an appreciable proper motion of just over two seconds of arc per year, and that can be noticed. And way back in 1718, Edmund Halley, the second astronomer royal, realized that Arcturus had shifted very slightly in position against the background of more distant stars over recorded times. And we now know just what's happening. Arcturus at the moment is coming towards us at about 90 miles a second. It became visible with the naked eye about half a million years ago. It's now brightening up, and it's moving very slowly in the direction of the constellation of Virgo. It'll become brighter and brighter, but then, as it starts to move away again, it will dim. And in about half a million years, when it reaches the boundary of Virgo, it will have faded down below naked eye visibility. But of course, all this is very, very slow. And so far as we are concerned, Arcturus won't alter in our time, although you can measure the proper motion with very sensitive detecting equipment. Following round the line from the bear through Arcturus still further, we come to Spica, the bright white star in Virgo the Virgin. And that is a, a very close binary star, though with the naked eye it appears as one. And Virgo is a large constellation. You can see there the Y-shaped bow. Look, please, at the star at the base of the Y. That is called Arich, or if you like, Postvata or Polymer. And with the naked eye, it appears as a perfectly ordinary third magnitude star. But it's not. It's a lovely binary made of two equal components, each about three and a half times as luminous as the sun. And that's how I saw them with my three-inch refractor in 1939, I remember. But they don't look quite like that now. And the present view of the Arich, as you see it there to the right, they are very much closer together. And the same telescope and the same magnification. That doesn't actually mean that they have approached each other. Arich is a binary star, and the two components are going together around their common center of gravity, very much as the two bells of a dumbbell will do when you twist them by the bar joining them. And they take 171 years to go around. But we are now seeing them at a less favorable angle. And by the year 2016, they'll be almost one behind the other, so to speak, and no ordinary telescope will show Eric's as double. And after that, they'll start to open out again. There are plenty of spectacular binaries in the sky, but Eric's is a very, very good example. And seen from close view, it might be, I think, something rather like that. But also in Virgo, they're a different kind of star, Delta or Mene Lava. And this, again, is a third magnitude, but this is a red star, a red giant. And I wonder, is there a planet going around it? And if so, would that be the kind of view you'd have? I don't actually think that Mene Lava is the kind of star to have planets going around it, but we can't be sure, and we could see a planet there. And also in Virgo, we have the bowl, bounded on the far side by the nebula in the constellation of Leo. 
There are no bright stars inside the bowl, but there are plenty of faint galaxies, remote star systems many millions of light years away. These pictures, of course, were taken with large telescopes, and you can't see those with ordinary apertures, but there are plenty of faint galaxies in the bowl of Leo. And Leo itself is a large and splendid zodiacal constellation. I think the best way to locate it is to use the pointers toward the pole star in the opposite direction, downward, so to speak, and there you will come to Regulus, the bright first magnitude star in Leo, and coming up from there, 